I'm Lindsay McDougall and I'm going to be taking you on a very short course um, about ink making. Um, by no means am I a world leading expert but I have experimented quite a bit so hopefully I can impart some of that knowledge that I've gained um, that you'll be able to use um, these methods and these recipes that I have um, to make your own ink at home. This is very much based and catered for the kitchen kind of ink workshop um, and I've tried to keep the ingredients and the equipment list as, as minimal as possible and hopefully that you have most of these things in your house already um, so you won't have to um, spend very much money to be able to achieve some of the results that we get today. Um, I am going to first introduce you to, and I've got some notes here, just what ink is exactly and what we're talking about. Um, the, re the process of ink making ink hasn't changed over um, since its invention. Essentially, we use quite a lot of the same ingredients and the same equipment. Um, and so we have to um, search for um, the right ingredients and things, but we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. But first of all, I just wanted to introduce you to the basic concept of what ink is. And really it's a colour plus a liquid. Um, and I've heard it described as capturing um, liquid in, or like the landscape in a bottle. Um, and that's a really nice way of putting it. Um, we're going to look at the three different kind of things that you need to make ink. And one of them, the first one is the vehicle. The vehicle to kind of hold the colour. Um, and that's we use uh, we can use water oil or alcohol and um, we're also thinking about the binder um, and that's the glue that binds that liquid together and the color together and in a lot of the time i use gum arabic and um, it's a really effective um uh, it's a very effective uh ingredient um and we also have to think about the uh, um, additives. So the things like salt, vinegar and metals that kind of really intensify the ink color and they help to make it more permanent. We also add things like um, wintergreen oil, which I'll talk a little bit more later about as well. And that helps to preserve it too, to stop it from going moldy, especially if you're um, using something like berries or to make your color. Um, as I said, this is very much about the kitchen lab and I've tried to keep it as simple as possible. Um, one of the most important things about ink making is that you sterilize everything that you're going to use because in that way we protect um, the ink from bacteria and we don't want it to um, be damaged in any way by mold um, so we have to sterilize all of our equipment thoroughly before we start and how you do that is just like you would sterilize a baby's bottle you can uh, make a large pot of water and just put your equipment in there and that goes for everything including um, all the equipment list that I'm going to show you now. I'm going to be making four different types of ink in this workshop. The first one is alder cones and then blackberries oak galls and copper oxide. Those are the four different inks that we're going to be making. Um, there's different ways of collecting your material to make your ink. Um, and the alder cones and blackberries and oak galls were all foraged from outside. And the copper oxide was actually, a, um, a friend gave me some scraps of copper oxide. So in a way you're kind of foraging through maybe a garage or somebody's um, workshop just to, to try and get copper uh, scraps. But what I want to talk a little bit more in detail about is foraging outside in nature in the landscape because there's some rules that we have to apply and there's some things that we should do to kind of make sure that we're, that we're not damaging anything or anybody's property etc. So these are some of my foraging tips that I hope that you, if you do go outside to kind of collect berries or whatever you might want to collect, that you stick to these um, tips and rules. Um, so, first of all, always a good idea to wear some gardening gloves that you can see here. And I always have a little um, foraging bag and I've just dropped them, but I'm gonna pick them up now. My lovely gardening sears. So they're just like a little pair of sharp um, scissors that you can use to maybe cut some branches or leaves or whatever off the trees. Um, you need as well an identification book 
or have somebody there that's full of knowledge of, of, of the plants um, that you're going to be collecting. Um, but an identification book is always a really great idea. You should never forage for anything that you can't identify. You don't know what it is, then leave it. Because it could be poisonous, you just don't know. It could cause, cause rash, rashes, etc. So you must be very, very careful. You must only ever pick things that you know exactly what they are. Um, if you're foraging on somebody's land or in somebody's garden, obviously ask the owner and make sure that it's okay first. And um, let me see what else have I got on this list. Yes, so the, one of the most important things is never to pick too much in a particular area. So when I was, for instance, collecting the alder cones from my dad's garden, um, he has five trees. So I collected like a little bundle off each of the trees. With alder cones, you can actually wait as well until they've fallen on the ground. So you're kind of foraging on the grass and they're already kind of dispersed from the tree. And that's actually a really great practice as well. So you're trying, for instance, if I was even going to be collecting nettles, which could make a really nice greeny yellow color of an ink, then I would go to an area with lots of nettles and I would pick um, some nettles from one place and I would move to the next kind of batch of nettles. Um, if you pick all of the flowers or nettles or whatever, the weeds even, in one area, what that does is depletes that area of that particular um, plant and that's not a good idea. You want to leave plenty so that it can grow again and flourish. So you're always just being aware not to overpick. Um, it's the same with blackberries and, and, and raspberries as well. You want to leave plenty of berries for the birds and the other animals that like to eat it. So you're just giving, giving nature its space. You're not overpicking, and that's a really important thing. Um, I think that's everything that I wanted to share with you about collecting and foraging. Um, but as I said, you can find things in your kitchen cupboard, your coffee, your turmeric, um, avocado skins, onion skins, there's lots of things that you can use in your kitchen cupboard to um, uh, use in your ink making. So now I'm going to talk you through the basic kind of ingredient or equipment, sorry, list that you will be able to use. Um, the first thing on my list is a strainer. Very, very important. I have strainers of different sizes. I don't use the same strainer as I would in the house for cooking. It's a good idea if you can get either an, use an old strainer or if you can um, buy, buy one. <laughs> um, it's up to you. Um, if you do use your kitchen one just make sure you thoroughly wash it um, and it might stain so I honestly would advise you although this is kitchen based and I said I'm going to keep it as simple as possible it is always good and it's always good practice to kind of keep a separate um, equipment um, and even that goes for the pot which is the next thing on my list I just have a really old pot that was going to get thrown out and I can use that to do a bit of ink making you don't need a pot for every single ink that, recipe that I'm going to take you through um, but you do for some of them so um, it is advisable to get an old pot um, I also have just an old wooden spoon as well that I use and I got these little jars which collect the ink when you're finished and they're really handy to have to keep the ink and obviously then you want to label your jars as well um, and um, I think that's everything on my list is it oh yes and um, also some of these little funnels and um, especially when you're working with jars this size you kind of need a tiny little funnel um, to be able to, to um, use that. And on some of the recipes, what we use as well is coffee filters um, in a strainer like this, where we can strain really, really finely all of the unwanted kind of grit and um, thickness in the ink. Um, so we can make an ink that you can write with essentially. So um, as you can tell, um, strainers and these kinds of things are very much part of ink making. Um, it's a slow process in some occasions, um, but it's a really beautiful process if you just give yourself time. Also important to acknowledge that we don't need, there's not a right or wrong here. You can make ink with anything. Um, I don't think I've said this yet, but um, I've heard a really lovely thing said once that ink making is like capturing a landscape and putting it into a bottle. So that's essentially what you're doing and that does take a little bit of time. But like I said, this is about 
experimenting um, and you can get things wrong and that can make the best results sometimes. Um, mistakes are sometimes really important. Now the first um, ink that I'm going to show you today is the blue ink. Copper oxide ink should give you a really bl lovely blue colour and how you, you don't have to use any heat for this particular um, ink making so I'm just going to talk you through this. I've actually had to make it before because um, it's something that I always kind of have on the go so I'll just show you the beautiful blue colour that you can get from this. Um, as you can see it's really gorgeous. You can see the cloudiness and then you can see the water and what we're going to do is before I pour it into our lovely little jars we're going to actually shake that up because it's the ink when it's mixed together that's the colour that we want and that's the kind of the best um, the best colour and the best fixative as well so we're going to use that. Now I'll talk you through how I made this and um, first of all I used some copper scraps so um, I actually got some from a friend of mine but you might be able to find some copper lying about if not you can order little scraps of cotton or sorry copper <laughs> cotton, um, on the internet and things like that so you will be able to, you might know somebody that has some scraps of copper and um, then what you do is you're just also using you're putting your copper in your jar and then you add salt one tablespoon of salt and two cups of white vinegar or 480 milliliters, just the normal white vinegar that you have at home. And um, then you use your stick or your spoon to like kind of stir that together. And what you do then is you leave that for a couple of weeks. You don't have to do anything else. And this is actually left for, I think a couple of months because I'd actually lost it. I'm just supporting over myself. I couldn't find it. <laughs> so, cause I moved house, but anyway. Um, so what, what I'm going to do now is show you how we can pour this into the lovely containers. Um, this colour is stunning um, and we can do a little bit of experimenting with this colour as well. This is one of the easiest ones to, to make. All you need is a little bit of patience and those ingredients that I told you. Copper, salt and vinegar. Um, you need to leave the mixture in a well ventilated area uncovered um, for one to three weeks. So I would, when you're leaving it uncovered um, for those first couple of weeks, I would put it somewhere out of reach of pets and children or anyone else that might come along and think that it's um, drinkable. And um, make sure you clearly label it and just keep it out of the way. And safety is always really, really important. I mean, it doesn't look very drinkable, but you never know. Um, so just be very, very careful. After those three weeks, you can then cover um, because your oxidation has happened already so you can actually cover the lid you put the lid back on and then it's safe but still clearly keep it away from anybody um, and, and kids and stuff that, and anybody that might think that they can drink it because nobody wants to drink this and um, I will now try and do a little bit of experimenting with this and, and as well as pour it into the lovely little jar, jar that we have and see if we can make some nice patterns um, and then we'll move on to the next ink making which we will be using a heat, heat source but this is one of the nicest easiest kind of ones um, and hopefully you get as good a color as that I've just used an old jar as well so a lot of recycling happens here okay so I'm going to just show you how you can and this goes for all of the different inks that we're going to make um, on in this session um, how you can pour your ink into essentially your pot and um, as I said I've got these lovely little pots and um, you can use whatever like a jam jar um, or whatever is easiest but what you do want is some sort of like um, small kind of uh, straining device essentially <laughs> um, but that's the last kind of bit that we do the first thing that we need to do is strain it into a jar using the coffee filter and um, I'm going to strain it into this jar first and use my lovely funnel um, and this just makes it, and I'm not going to put all this ink in here, it's just a little bit. This just means that 
I am making sure that the ink is lovely and ready to be used like I said in your if you're going to use it for drawing or um, if you're going to use it in a pen this is the best way and this is the best kind of filtering and um, you can see that it's just going to filter down it'll take a little minute to do that and um, as I said I'm not going to empty this whole jar today I'm just going to leave it um, but it's really lovely the way it's kind of emptying into this um, and I'll just let it kind of filter down and I'll get my lovely little um, glass jar ready so I'll give that a little shake kind of an encouragement to go on further um, you can use gloves um, if you don't want to stain your hands I'm kind of used to it but um, it is always good if you want to keep your hands from getting really dirty and stained then you should use some gloves I'm going to leave that like this and you'll see that I've got a lovely strained ink now um, and what I can do is just pour this into the little jar um, Now we have a beautiful blue copper oxide ink. We have our little topper, like so. And I will then label this jar because that's really important. Like I said, very importantly, you do not want anybody to miss stick this for anything else although this color isn't it doesn't look very edible but let's not take any risks now the other thing that you might want to do is experiment and so we'll do this the best paper to use i find is paper that you would maybe use for watercolors something like that and um, so we'll take this lovely little sheet of paper and we will take our little bottle with the topper and we can kind of just experiment with this color um, it's a lovely blue colour as you can see I'm going to put a lot on here and it'll eventually soak into the paper it depends what paper you use some paper is very porous and, and that's kind of the best paper to use um, but I'm just going to kind of like let that dry in I've got this gorgeous kind of bluey colour and we can look at that later on and see how we get on with that and um, you never really know as I said it's all about experimenting and I can just leave it there so that's one way of experimenting and I'm just going to let that dry and soak um, and then also like a piece of fabric if you've got an old piece of linen or cotton or any natural fabric will probably take the ink a little bit better and again you can just kind of experiment <laughs> and enjoy yourself it's a lovely way of getting a really really quick colour again I'll just let that dry in the sun and um, the sun is kind of bleaching the colour a little bit um, in the camera but it is a really beautiful blue so I just wanted to show you the different um, results that we get and um, this is on the paper the blue ink on the paper and it looks amazing and all the details that you get if you just leave the ink for a little um, while this is about an hour later this is the result and um, it's active so it'll change over time um, and this is a piece of paper just that was in the way really essentially and then also the fabric you can see the lovely blue color you can get from that so this is just the experiments with that um, copper oxide so you're just experimenting playing around um, and you can create these beautiful, beautiful patterns. Our next dye, or ink, sorry, that we're going to use is um, oak gall ink. And we're going to make those with galls that you get off the oak tree. And you might ask, what is an oak gall? And they look a bit like this, and you can find them on oak trees. And they've got a or a few holes in them like these 
um, or like this one. And what they are is, they can be called oak apple or oak gall and is, is the common name really for a large round vaguely apple-like gall and um, it's about one to two inches in diameter and um, it happens actually when um, it was caused by chemicals injected by the larva of certain kinds of gall wasps so that's what happens and it's like a reaction between the tree and the female wasp um, injecting her larva into the tree and this is what happens this is a reaction so you can get them in the wild you can pick them but they're actually quite hard to, sometimes to find and you can also order them online i only have a very small selection that i was able to find so um we're going to try and make black ink with this and um, but if you can't find them like i said oh i just lost one you can actually order them online now the first thing you have to do um with um oak galls is break them down with your in your pestle and mortar, mortar into a fine powder so you can see the inside there no I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep going with this because it could take me a little while and i'll skip on until it's a fine powder and show you that in a moment have 55 grams of our oak galls in here it's now a fine powder it's been crushed down um, and you can see that it's ready to go to the next stage the next stage is getting an old pot as I said not one that you cook with necessarily so here's our old pot and what we're gonna do is we're gonna add the oak galls powder okay and about two cups or 480 millilitres of water. What we do is we leave that for a day at least. And what happens is that that solution changes into, um, there's a reaction that happens and it becomes gallic and tannic acid. And then we strain this solution through a coffee filter um, or a, you know a cheesecloth or something like that into our glass container um, and then that's when we add after that our iron which is also known as um, brist sulfite um, but we will get to that next stage just now so I'll just give it a little wishy about the next day this has been sitting for 24 hours so you have this solution um, and it is now our gallic and tannic acid solution and what we want to do is add our first sulfite or our iron so as I don't know if I've explained yet but um, iron you can crush up iron supplement tablets or you can buy this stuff um, at your pharmacy or online and you're just putting in about 30 mill milliliters or about a one ounce of the iron into that solution you give that another swish um, and then this is ready to be I'm going to now strain it into a little glass jar and we, we can do some experiments with it okay so we're now ready to strain in our solution so I'm just going to do a little bit at a time here using the little strainer And then what we do is, this should give us a black ink. Um, I know it'll look brown in your jar at the moment, but it's actually the reaction between the oxygen and the ink that creates the blackness. So it'll become more apparent um, on your page when you start to use it. Um, what I'm also going to add is just a little drop of gum arabic. Um, Again, you can get gum arabic in your local pharmacy or online and it's really a dried um, extract from stems and branches of the archaea tree um, and it's been used a lot in cosmetics and things. It's a natural um, ingredient and it's used a lot in cosmetics. But we're just going to use a few little drops of it. 
so not very much at all like about half a tablespoon and I'm going to put that in there and what that does is it acts as a kind of thickener what we can do is put a lid on you must keep your lid on your bottle and make sure you just shake it up um, and make sure everything mixes through that's actually on this surface and um, then what we're going to do is obviously label this I've made one earlier so I'm going to use this as my label so you can see here I've got oak gall ink um, and I've written the ingredients on there oak gall iron um, I also stuck wintergreen oil into this one so you can do that as well if you want to and what that does is just stops it from um, fermenting or getting blue mold and um, wintergreen oil is I can't find mine but anyway it's just a little drop um, and then I have that I've put um, Arabic oil powder in there as well so we've just got all the ingredients so that's ready to experiment with to experiment I've got a lovely piece of paper and um, this one is Somerset velvet newsprint grey color it's a really nice color I think it'll look nice with the black um, and I'm using a Chinese brush that I got that I picked up um, I think it's for calligraphy, maybe not, maybe just painting, I don't know. But it's a really nice brush to, to work with. Um, so what you can do then is you can put a little bit of your... Hold on, sorry. <laughs> okay, you can dip your brush in directly if you want to. You can see that it's starting to turn black here already. Um, and I'm going to do just a big swoosh so you can see it's a beautiful black ink and this ink was was used in the medieval period oh it's the wind um, and so it's a really lovely connection to you know our past um, and our ancestors who would have made oak gull ink themselves and um, so you can just mess about with that I really don't know what I'm doing here I'm not doing anything in particular I'm just trying to do a bit of mark making we'll do some dots I'm also a stitcher so everything that I draw ends up being like a stitch sometimes but you can just kind of enjoy it for what it is if you really hate your drawing <laughs> you could um, always do you know revert to doing those butterfly paintings that you do when you're a kid but really it's just about experimenting I can actually really smell the lovely um, winter green oil in there um, and it is a good way of saving your ink and stopping it from going moldy I quite like that so I'm gonna stop soon I think you could draw with this and you can put it in a calligraphy pen and um, really you can do whatever you want with this ink just don't drink it so there's like a big black blob um, and you can also use your dipper if you've got one of these like contraptions to kind of just like put stuff on it as well although I think mine's a bit clogged up there so it's not really working but anyway the idea is that you experiment with this and um, you can draw with it you can use it in your ink pen um, just make sure that you wash your pen afterwards and that you let your um, drawing dry but it's quite spectacular to get such a beautiful black deep deep black color from um, oak galls and I think it's a lovely process to go through so hopefully you enjoy it so we're going to make blackberry ink now I think ink making with berries is probably one of the easiest ways to make really beautiful pigments um, and it's a fairly easy process so this process can be applied to any of the berries that you can pick in Northern Ireland or Ireland um, and I picked these blackberries actually last at the end of last summer um, and I froze them so it's another way of just you know sort of um, if you've got leftover blackberries you're not making your blackberry pie or you've got leftover from jam making then you know you can use that stuff to make 
um, your lovely blackberry ink. So here I have some frozen that are kind of defrosting at the moment. Um, and what I'm gonna do is just put those into my pot. And li literally all you have to do, and this just seems too simple to, to be true sometimes, but all you have to do is crush those up with a potato masher um, or something. I'm just crushing them. And all that juice that's coming out is actually going to end up being your ink. So, depending on how much ink you want to make, in this case I've put about two cups of blackberries in there, um, but depending on how many, how much ink you need, two cups should give me a small jar, um, which is all I need at the moment. So I'm going to keep doing that until it's well crushed. step is filtering all of those lovely crushed berries and um, with a fine mesh strainer into uh, a jar that is pourable so it has a little lip so that you're going to be e easily able to pour that into your tiny little container so it's the next stage um, it's a bit awkward <laughs> for me to show you but um, probably from this angle but that's it dripping in and then you just literally filter out all of the juice. It's pretty much like juicing your berries. Once you've got all your juice in there, you're ready to pour it into your little jar. I've got one from earlier that I made. Here we go. We have the little jar of blackberry ink. Um, I have blackberry and I've also put one drop of wintergreen oil in there as well. Um, it's just a little squirt of the wintergreen oil. Again, you can get that anywhere. It's not difficult to find. You'll get it in your local pharmacy or you might get it in your um, local healthcare shop. But anyway, this is ready to experiment with. The wintergreen oil again just makes sure that the blackberries and whatever berries you're using, you can use wintergreen oil, just one squirt, which will just help it not ferment or have any blue mold or anything like that. So it just keeps it safe from, from those um, conditions. And I also keep my blackberry ink and any berry ink in the fridge. Um, and that's why it's really important to label it very well so that nobody thinks that it's something that they're going to eat. Um, so I keep this in the fridge, it'll keep longer, um, it could keep up to about six months in the fridge. If it's just left out, it might last a couple of weeks. So it's up to you, um, but that's the best place for it. So we're ready to experiment. So I will grab a piece of paper and we can do a little bit of experimenting. This is just a lovely cream, soft white piece of paper and we've got our lovely blackberry ink and we're ready to experiment again i'm going to use my lovely um pen or sorry pen <laughs> my lovely brush and we're going to go for it we're just going to dip it in and swig now as you can see it's a fairly pale color and it's more pink really than black as you can tell, or even purple. But this has been in, I think I made this last week. So this has been in my fridge for a little week. So it's maybe not, it's maybe changed a bit of color. Remember ink are, inks are so natural and they change constantly and over time, but that's all part of it. And all these little imperfections in the ink are things that I like. Now, if you want to get rid of those, it's, all to do with what you strain it through. So you can strain it, rather than straining it through the fine mesh um, strainer, you can actually use a piece of of like cotton cloth or cheesecloth or something like that and put it over um, and then obviously um, drain your berries through that. That'll make it even finer and there won't be as, as many imperfections. But for me, I like all these little dots and things that I've got through. Okay. 
Okay, so now we're going to learn how to make ink from alder cones. Now these alder cones I collected, um, I think it was in September, October time. I've kept them in a brown envelope or ba little bag here um, and I'll show you what they look like. You will notice they're very, very, very distinctive. Um, beautiful little cones. You may have them in your garden, you may see them in your parks or um, other places, forest walks, um, but they're quite small little cones and if you even have a close look at that you can just see that how distinctive they are. So if you see these cones you know that they're alder cones. Um, have a look at your identification book, um, have a look at the tree obviously that they're coming from and stuff like that and that'll help you identify them. But once you've identified them they are brilliant cones for natural dyes, for fabrics and also for ink making. They have a lot of tannin in them which makes them a really really good source of um, ink. So what I'm going to do now is put these into an old pot. There we go. Just chuck them in for now. And I'm going to add two uh, tablespoons of white vinegar and one tablespoon of salt to this pot and then I'm going to let it simmer for a couple of you, um, pardon me, hours um, on the stove just in my kitchen and then we'll come back and have a look and see what colour we've got at that point. This is the alder cones bubbling away here. I've turned it down to a low simmer and I'm going to leave it now for a couple of hours just to let the colour really um, become very very intense in the water. Just make sure you don't leave it too long, you know, set your alarm, make sure you keep going back to it. You don't want it to burn but you do want to kind of get um, as much colour extracted from the alder cones as possible. We'll come back to this in a couple of hours and we'll be straining it into the bottle. Okay, so I just want to talk to you about these two um, ingredients that I've been using. Um, what they both do are slightly different, but they make the ink more permanent. Um, when you add gum arabic, it acts as a binder, so really don't add it until you have achieved that colour that you want from your ink and when it's at its deepest colour. It's about two, as a rule, it's about two ounces, 60 millilitres um, per bottle of ink. Um, but Really be careful because if you want to use your ink in a pen, then you want to use as little gum arabic as possible. So just um, like one teaspoon is usually enough. Your wintergreen oil or a clove of, um, or a clove you can use as well. Um, but I use usually use wintergreen oil. It's just a few drops in each bottle is going to keep your ink from molding. And that's literally all it's really for. Um, it has a very, very, very distinctive smell. Um, it reminds me of uh, TCP, um, if you can remember that. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a very, very, very strong smell. Um, but yeah, it stops your ink from molding, so it's a really, really good tool. Um, so that's your gum arabic and your wintergreen oil, both used to make your ink more permanent. Okay, so now we're going to experiment with our alder cone ink. Um, again, I have alder cone ink written clearly on the bottle and I've written alder cones, gum arabic and wintergreen oil. Those are the ingredients. So I've got my lovely brush, I've got my pot of ink. We're going to just, oh, excuse me, <laughs> put our ink in. You get this lovely, I suppose it's like a coffee colour, but it's a lovely, I think, actually it's more um, yellow in tone than you would get with coffee. Um, and it's this lovely ink. It's quite gentle ink, it's not um, as kind of thick. Of course if I wanted that thicker I could add more gum arabic, but I quite like this sort of movement of this one. Um, 
Um, I'm just going to leave it like that. I do like that one. So yeah, I'm just messing about, as you can see, with lots of different designs and colours and just experimenting with the ink. I'm not worried too much about what the outcome is. And I suppose the whole thing about this workshop is that you just experiment. But like I said, if you do want to use your ink for, for writing, that's also um, okay. You just lay off the gum arabic if you do, because that makes it thicker and you don't want it to be too thick if you're trying to use it for that. But um, this in this consistency would actually be really good in the pan. I'd like to show you some of the experiments that I've done with the ink that you might make um, as a result of this workshop. So this is one, um, this is alder cones from a little while ago. Here we go from earlier, we have our lovely um, oak gall black ink. Our berry ink, our blackberry ink, oak gall ink. You can see that you can get so many nice different examples. This is our um, ox or sorry, our copper oxide. There we go. So hopefully you will get to experiment and do lots of stuff with yours as well. Um, I'll leave you there with that. The last thing I just want to say is a few health and safety tips. Um, first of all, remember that when you're using equipment for ink making, that you should try and not use stuff that you're going to be cooking with or that anyone's going to be eating um, out of afterwards. And if you do, then make sure that you clean them thoroughly after use. Um, the other health and safety things is you wear gloves if you can, it does help, um, although I haven't throughout this workshop I find it quite difficult to wear gloves at times, um, it does keep your hands from getting stained and it does keep you safe. Um, when you're foraging go by the rules that we chatted about, never pick anything that you don't know or can't identify and um, just be really careful but enjoy your ink making process and enjoy experimenting. I also wanted to share some publications that I have found really, really helpful. Um, this one is Wild Colour. The reason that I find it really helpful is actually because it's more, it's actually geared towards fabric. But a lot of the same principles are that are applicable in fabric dyeing, natural dyes, are applicable in when you're making your own ink as well. So it's actually really great and it has a colour palette for each kind of um, plant or tree bark or whatever substance they're using and it gives you all the colours that you can get from it. This is an also a really, really great book called Make Ink by Jason Logan. Um, and it's a really good guide. It got me started on ink making. It's um, beautiful illustrations and you know lots of experimenting with different colours. So I think um, there's plenty in there to go on. As I probably said already, ink making hasn't changed that much since the medieval period. Um, and so we're learning a lot about how people made ink and we're by doing the processes it's a really lovely way of connecting to the past um, but most importantly it's a way for you to connect with the landscape around you to use up your kitchen waste and also to really um, experiment with colour and um, enjoy it most importantly but always keeping safe and, and being sensible.